Thank you so much for your, your presentation. Doctor, um, we saw a lot of numbers there and we wanna open it up to questions so that we can look at that legislation a bit more closely. That was very, very helpful. Um, it's important with all of these conversations, especially regarding healthcare, to personalize it and to understand how it is an issue that impacts people in our community and in our state. It's not just numbers, it's people, it's their lives, their children, the people they care about. So we wanted to bring up um, two individuals who are going to share brief reflections about how healthcare has um, impacted them and how access to healthcare has impacted them. Um, Leah Kenig, am I, am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay. <laughs> Terrific, you can come on up, thank you so much. Um, Leah is a nurse, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, no, 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 I was reading the wrong one. Food, food writer, cookbook author, uh, SD17 resident, so she lives in the district, um, and uh, yeah, blogger, author, writer, so, so you wanted to talk briefly about how um, healthcare has impacted you and your family's financial security, and go right ahead. Okay. Um, cool, thanks for having me. Nice to see everybody here. Um, I'm Leah, this is Matt. Um, <laughs> so, uh, my husband and I and my son live in the neighborhood. Uh, we're, well, we live in Kensington, and um, my husband and I are both freelancers. I'm a food writer and cookbook author, my husband's a musician. Um, and we currently rely very strongly on the Affordable Care Act to be able to pay our health insurance. Um, for our family, I'll, I'll do hashtag real talk, I'll tell you the number. <laughs> we pay uh, around $820 for our family of three to be insured. It's a, big, it's a big number, I'd love to pay less than that, but we were able to make it work um, with our current, you know, what, what we make. But um, last summer and into the fall when the Affordable Care Act was, you know, threatened to be taken away many, many, many times by Congress. It seemed to be the one thing they were really drilling in on. It scared, it scared me um, a lot because we could definitely not afford health care for our family of hardworking uh, freelancers um, and, our, and our kids um, if we didn't have the Affordable Care Act or something else. So um, to see the work that's happening here um, and to think that we might be able to have some sort of single payer option that would keep healthcare affordable for our family um, is really a wonderful thought and I hope that our state senator, Siska Felder, can hop on board with that at some point and that we let him know that that really matters to us. So um, yeah, I guess that's, that's what I would love to share. Thank you so yeah, much. Uh, Debbie, come on up. Okay. Debbie uh, Herden is a nurse, a midwife, and a project manager um, at Maimonides, and she wanted to reflect quickly on how this issue touches her and her family. And I'm going to stand here because I have to read. Um, so I'm, I'm Debbie, and I'm here to talk about two important groups who will benefit from the New York Health Act. One is chronically ill patients, and two are providers of medical care. Um, I'm speaking personally um, as a mother and a member of this community. Um, so I'm going to speak about my son, Ruby. Um, he approved my speaking about him, and he approved me showing this picture. <laughs> so, uh, my son, Ruby, was born here in Manhattan in November 2004, shortly after the re-election of George W. Bush. He was a beautiful baby, like all the moms say, and he weighed just over six pounds. He had a very loud cry, and he nursed like a champ. He more than doubled his birth weight by the fifth month, which happened to be the month we relocated to live in Israel, um, which is the home of my son's father's family. But we noticed something was wrong. Um, around the time we arrived in Israel, my son started to wake up in the middle of the night with painful cries and bloody stool. Stool is another name for a poop. <laughs> he was really suffering, so I took him to the pediatrician. And you should know that when we arrived in Israel, we became citizens, and so we were immediately part of the National Insurance Plan, which has two carriers. This was really important as we spent most of the next five months in and out of doctor's offices. <clears throat> Finally, um, at 10 months of age, my son had a colonoscopy and was diagnosed with colitis. This is a disease that causes inflammation of the colon or large intestine. Um, this is the last stop as water is absorbed and the remaining food waste material is stored as stool before defecation. By 10 months old, um, he was admitted to the hospital for failure to thrive, meaning he had failed to gain any weight for five months, which is a very big deal when you're a baby. 
Finally, he was treated with all kinds of medications and put on a special diet with, which helped him heal. <laughs> okay, so take a deep breath. Let me tell you, it's, it's difficult to tell this story, and during my son's first two years, I was such a sleep-deprived, nervous wreck um, due to coping with his condition and being a nursing mom. But during that period, which involved two week-long hospitalizations, a myriad of tests and medications, all of the care was covered under our insurance. Um, we were required to pay for prescription medications at a reduced cost. It took me a while to adjust to living in Israel and not to receiving any bills for medical care and not worrying about whether or not our son would be covered. Had we been living in the U.S., he may or may not have received the same care because he was born before the Affordable Care Act was passed and it might have been prohibitive, prohibitively expensive for us because he was essentially born with a pre-existing condition. Just thinking about that causes a whole lot of cognitive dissonance. Um, we moved back to the U.S. in 2010, just after the ACA was passed. As it stands today, Ruby is covered under his dad's employer-based plan and covered for most expenses related to his condition. He now has Crohn's colitis, which means sometimes he has other symptoms like joint pains and he will have this disease for his whole life unless it's cured. Studies have shown that inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, is becoming more common in children and adults in the United States. According to the CDC, more than one million people suffer from IBD. The cause of IBD is unknown, and until we understand more, prevention or a cure will not be possible. We do, under, we do understand that IBD affects some populations more than others. Ulcerative colitis is slightly more common in males, while Crohn's disease is more frequent in women. Um, IBD occurs more commonly in Caucasian and Ashkenazi Jewish people than in other racial and ethnic subgroups. Um, although these, these previously noted racial and ethnic differences seem to be narrowing. <clears throat> so my son Ruby receives IV medication treatments about every eight weeks. These treatments cost up to $10,000. He's had one major hospitalization since he was a baby at age nine and a half. He's 13 and well now, but always under the threat of a recurrence. If his father or I lost our insurance, we would not be able to afford his treatment. When he is old enough, he will need to get his own insurance. He may require expensive medical treatment for the rest of his life. So for my son, Ruby, and for all chronically ill kids and adults, we need the Affordable Care Act. And we need, I'm sorry, we need New York Health Act. And we need um, Medicare for all, both of those. <laughs> Thank you so much, Debbie, for your thoughts um, and for sharing your, your family story. So we want to be able to uh, answer questions that people might have um, for Dr. Fine about, uh, about this legislation. Um, and I guess... One question that I have is, can you, you mentioned during the presentation about this being tried in other states where it has not yet been successful. Can you talk about any of those situations and how New York may or may not be different and what gives you confidence that it could work here if it hasn't worked in so far in Colorado or Vermont or another state? Okay, well, it's not that it hasn't worked. It hasn't actually been enacted, okay? Uh, in California, which uh, passed uh, a single-payer uh, act, what we had was Arnold Schwarzenegger, who vetoed it, okay? And that was, uh, you know, uh, in the year, I think, 2006 or seven. Uh, so it never actually was passed there. Then in Vermont, uh, you know, we had uh, Governor Shumlin, uh, and a strong legislative support for moving in the direction uh, of a state single-payer program. Uh, they created the Green Mountain Healthcare Board. This was in 2010, so it was in the early part of the ACA. Uh, and then when Shumlin was up for re-election uh, in 2014, um, he looked at things and he said, I don't think we can afford to do this in the state of Vermont. And on some level, he may have been right. The state of Vermont uh, really didn't have the income base, you know, to really, uh, I think, enact 
uh, a universal coverage pr program in the state. They have one other very interesting problem that I think they began to realize, and that is where did the really most expensive care get done? Well, one of them was in the state capital, right, uh, essentially, in Burlington, right? But the other was in Dartmouth, right? Which is in what state? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. So they began to worry that a lot of the resources would be going out of state, uh, actually, rather than staying within the state. And that's what I think made Shumlin really very nervous about it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just about a, a year and a half ago, the state of Colorado had this on its agenda. It got to a place where they, they have a uh, you know, procedure where uh, you can vote on like a referendum, uh, uh, but what I think they did not anticipate, they got it on the referendum ballot, but the first thing that you saw if you were a voter uh, when you voted on this is that this will cost the state, I think they said, 60 to 70 billion dollars. And I think many, many voters said, what? We hadn't heard that, and they hadn't been prepared, essentially. So one of the important things, again, uh, and, 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 and that ballot initiative uh, didn't pass, uh, so one of the important things that we have to realize is that there's going to be opposition against this, right? The insurance companies are going to, you know, really come down very hard against this. The pharmaceutical companies will not like having a large, you know, uh, negotiator for prices. Uh, so they'll be against it, right? And probably even some of the major academic medical centers here in the city are going to be against a state single-payer approach. Uh, and so we've got to inoculate the public to all of those negative things that will be raised about this bill um, and really realize that, in fact, uh, you know, it will lead to savings in spite of what I think we may hear uh, from the industries that are going to be harmed by this. So keep that in mind. Um, no state has actually tried or has gotten to the place of literally implementing the change. Uh, because we haven't been able to get the legislatures in those states either to pass it or the governors to agree to put it, you know, to not veto it, essentially. Yes, in the back. Hi, thank you so much. This is great. Um, can you talk a little bit about the cost savings and the life savings of having more people have access to preventive care and early care as opposed to just going to the emergency room when things get really bad? Yeah, no, I think that that's, uh, you know, real, real potential savings can come from preventive care, right? But those are savings that do not happen frequently right away, right? It may take a number of years for preventive care to actually result in an overall savings. It's one of the reasons why private health insurance companies frequently have not been terribly good at covering preventive care because they believe if they prevent an illness, it may come to benefit the Medicare program, you know, in 10 years, rather than benefit them. Um, or they begin to worry that, in fact, that employer will go to another private insurance company and prevention, the benefit of prevention, will go to that uh, insurer rather than to themselves. So prevention is an, an important territory, but it really, again, uh, only occurs if you have something like a single-payer program. Uh, where you can really, uh, over the lifetime of a patient, begin to really see uh, the benefits that come from preventive care. Yes, in the back. Uh, I have a few questions. 
point. I'm very passionate about this subject, but I, um, number one, why, why do we have to inoculate the public? Why don't we put the, the medical industry on the fence? Why don't we go on that path? Say about all the fraud, they get tax benefits or tax exemptions. They treat, they, they, a medical apartheid in New York City, let's say we're all um, proud of a Medicaid, ex we all um, talk about Medicaid expansion under Obamacare. Medicaid expansion, the Republicans are right, they don't like to say it, it's shit. No one takes it. Take all academic institutions. Like one doctor who takes it among them. I'm thinking about specialists. And talking about prevent, I don't, why do we go about these um, um, uh, kind of weak arguments about uh, money saving? The biggest argument is that it's, that there shouldn't be a, a two-tier and apartheid system of healthcare. And also, like they speak about people who pay, the, the biggest um, people who would support it are a third of the population who get Medicaid who know that they can't have access, there's no access to anyone. No one takes it. And, and they don't like speaking about it, the press doesn't like speak, speaking about it, but we can have, have um, put out, uh, putting, uh, putting them on the fence and, so yeah, well, I, I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, uh, we should try <clears throat> to, in fact, put uh, the insurers and, you know. And, and the Democratic Party. The biggest enemy to this is the Democratic Party. It's not the Republican Party. It, actually, there's a bigger chance. That both of them. One is worse. Okay. Each one is worse than the other. Right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so long as you agree that... that yeah. Both of them are a problem. But I think Trump is more unpredictable that I would be more surprised that it would happen under Kamala Harris than under Trump. Because with Kamala, for sure it's not, it's not gonna happen. Thank for you. sure it's all false. Thank okay, you, well, look at, oh, putting okay. Governor Cuomo on the fence. Why, how could it be, um, this well, isn't a that's, that's what we wanna do, is put him on the fence. I have, no, I have right. an important point. Why do we, uh, 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 make him accountable or answer to the fact that Medicaid uh, compensates doctors 50% of the Medicare, Medicare rate. That's only, mostly in democratic states. In, in Texas, they get 80%. Medicaid pays 80% 80, 80 of no, no, the Medicaid. No, 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 no. Thank you, sir. That's, that's according let's, to Kaiser. Let's, no, let's, uh, no. let's allow it, doctor. Thank okay. you for your, let, you for your interest. Right. Go ahead, doctor. Okay, let, let me be very clear. What you're talking about in that situation, in the, is what percent of the federal dollars go to uh, pay, you know, for the Medicaid program in the state? It is true. In Texas, they get 80% from the feds, and they only have to get 20% from the state budget. Here in New York, it's 50% from the feds, 25% from the state, and 25% from counties, okay? But that's because we are on a per capita basis a much more wealthy state than the state of Texas. And that's, that's the way the feds have worked it out. But that has nothing to do- I'm speaking about compensation. Uh, that has nothing to do with how doctors no, and hospitals- Kaiser, If you look at Kaiser list of all the states, how much they compensate doctors. In, the, in states that have less Medicaid expansion, they're able, they have a bigger fund, and they compensate doctors at a higher rate. Okay, well, I, I, I don't think it's the 80-20 that you're talking about. We can, okay. sir, sir, thank right, you. We can, that. we can we can certainly right. talk more about it after. We just have other questions that we want to get to. Did you have a question over here, ma'am? Did you, go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about how the New York State Health Act is similar in your question to what's happening in Massachusetts, what they have there? Yeah, well, in Massachusetts, the, the, the real difference uh, is in Massachusetts, you have you know the first incarnation of the ACA in some senses, and what you have are private health insurance companies that are in parallel, so to speak, to whatever the government is doing. And the New York Health Act says that there will be no private health insurance companies covering the benefits that are covered by the New York Health Act. It's very similar to the Canadian health approach, okay? 
So yes, private insurance can continue, but it can only, in fact, cover those things that are not covered by the New York Health Act, okay? So it would mean a very real transformation, both in terms of you know, the providers not having to have you know, all of the uh, accoutrements to deal with private you know, insurance, uh, if in fact what you did was uh, essentially say that you can't, private insurance can't cover what the public co uh, coverage covers. Does that make sense? Yes. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, yes, go ahead. Hi, so uh, my name is Francis. Uh, so just a quick point about the Medicaid thing. Um, also, New York State has a lot of generous benefits through Medicaid in the state of Texas, and they actually cover people based on income and not just disability. So I just wanted to point that out as to why Texas might take up a bigger, like, get some bigger federal share. My question is about um, specifically the combination of the different uh, federal funding sources and getting waivers to sort of dissolve Medicaid, Medicare, the VA, those funding sources, and pulling it into one large pool. My concern is I think about a uh, hostile state government. And I remember when George Pataki was governor. And I remember when the Senate was aggressively Republican in a way that was definitely unlike what we have now. And I worry that with that kind of framework, a hostile state government could try to limit benefits and access to quality, um, not just benefits, but like quality coverage, quality reimbursement, all that. So my question is, why are we trying to take this more, um, you know, sort of regulated approach where we're trying to just sort of shut down the private market, which I favor, but instead of doing that with all that kind of uh, uprooting of the current structure, why don't we just create a public option? Fund, like create a, a new tax to, uh, to create the fund for that, and then just push out private insurance options in the marketplace. Okay, so that's a very interesting uh, position, okay? And it's one that you're going to hear more and more from the Democratic Party uh, in, in, the, in the coming two years, frankly, before the 2020 presidential election. What's the problem with the public option? Um, well, frankly, I think the problem is that the private health insurance industry is enormously clever. And what it will do in the setting of a public option is try to offload onto the public option all of the truly sick patients. We've begun to see that already in the Medicare Advantage program. I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with this, but the advertising for the you know, Advantage program is very frequently a free health club membership. Oh, I said, that's great. I want my patients to be able to have a free health club membership. Then I said, well, who is really going to benefit from that? The people on dialysis? No, they, they don't want that. The pa patient with congestive heart failure who's having trouble walking up the stairs? You know, uh, you know, somebody with crippling arthritis? The really sick patients aren't attracted into that Medicare Advantage program. And the consequence is that the private health insurance program can offer you know, some additional little things and make a huge profit. Okay, that's what worries me about a public option in the context of having private health insurance. We will not save money, okay, through that. We will not be able, in fact, to use the administrative savings to grant access to everybody uh, in terms of care. Uh, and frankly, uh, what we'll end up with, it seems to me, uh, is a situation in which there still will be people who are uninsured. Uh, there still will be people, you know, uh, a, a, a system in which the cost of care is just outlandish. Thank you. We, we just have a couple more minutes for questions, so I just want to get a few more people in here and certainly continue the conversation afterwards. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to be fair to other people, sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Well, on, on the, the topic of Medicare, you, you had, how did you 
arrived at the, um, at the, I think you said 15% uh, administrative costs in Medicare? No, no. 6%. I said two to three percent. Two to three percent. Okay. <coughs> so how did you arrive at that when when Medicare has the Advantage program rolled into it as well? Okay. Well, there I am talking about the traditional Medicare program. In other words, what we call the original Medicare, which in fact covers still roughly two thirds of Medicare beneficiaries. Okay. Um, that's the one where you get a two or three percent administrative cost. Um, the the one third of Medicare enrollees who are in the Advantage program uh, are costing again a great deal more, and that's what you see as well. By the way, uh, you know if you compare the costs per uh, enrollee, uh, what happens now is that the Advantage program are costing more per enrollee than if the patients were in the original program. But I thought that I thought that Medicare only gives the Advantage companies a set amount of money equal to what the average patient costs. Well, it turns out legislatively they've done much better uh, in terms of how CMS does this. CMS has in fact reimbursed the Advantage companies with an advantage. <laughs> Are there so, other questions at Julio and then we'll go to that gentleman? And, and, uh, yeah. um, is there a scenario in which someone would not be covered under um, the New York Health Act or would lose their coverage? Um, in our vision of this, no, frankly. Uh, we would cover all residents of the state, okay? So that may be the most controversial thing I'm saying because that. What does it mean to cover all residents? Even the, Even the undocumented, okay? And yes, there might well be, you know, some restrictions so that people couldn't just come here, uh, you know, to get medical care. Um, so that, that's, you know, part of what's being discussed. But right now, it is all residents, and uh, yes, you know, thank you. Yeah. That's the answer. Let's, let's take a, let's take a few more, um, sir. We're going to go here, 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 and then I think that's it for our question time. But you're certainly welcome to ask Dr. Fine questions if I may volunteer you for more no questions problem. afterwards. No problem. So yes, thank go ahead. you. Uh, my name is David. Um, all right, thanks a lot. Could you just maybe explain, like, under Medicare right now? Um, provider choice and like if you're on Medicare and maybe live in this neighborhood, like what kind of access you have to different doctors. And then what I'm really wondering is like under Medicare for All or the New York Health Act, how you would envision, like I'm just trying to anticipate like, oh, so if there are doctors who are, I don't know, maybe very expensive or I don't know even what the discrepancy between how much it costs to go to different doctors, but how that would work under the new paradigm and whether or not under, you know, the New York Health Act, for example, if somebody, you know, who doesn't have a lot of money would still be able to go to maybe a more expensive doctor or how that would work. Okay, well, let me just point out that one wants to make a real distinction between Medicare and Medicaid these days. Uh, Medicare, uh, if you look nationwide, uh, close to 91 to 92 percent of physicians in this country take Medicare. Okay, in fact, in some parts of the country, they doctors prefer it to private insurance companies because the denials are less, uh, the payment is more rapid, and so forth. Um, I do not know what happens here in, in you know, District 17. Uh, the one place that may have the largest number of people who don't take Medicare happens to be the Upper East Side of Manhattan, <laughs> where I, you know, practice. <laughs> Why? Because there are many wealthy people there, and there are doctors who just don't take any insurance, private 
or public. Well, that should be an option. Okay, <laughs> right? So that they, there's a whole group of doctors like that, but they're not that large a number. It is different with Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid has a much lower reimbursement rate, and that's quite troublesome, frankly, so that, in fact, people don't take, uh, m many doctors don't take Medicaid. One of the reasons I practice in the clinic setting of my institution is so that I can see Medicaid patients, frankly, because in that context, I've been able to, you know, my practice is probably 50 to 60 percent Medicaid because, uh, you know, I'm in an institutional context, okay? Um, what will happen here under the New York Health Act, uh, the proposal is to increase up to the private reimbursement rate that exists in, in insurance, both the Medicaid and Medicare programs. The Medicare is probably just a little under a lot of private health insurance. Um, so that is where we would want to move, it seems to me, uh, is to make it so that even poor patients had at least financial, that they wouldn't be harmful to uh, a doctor who in fact, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, willing to see them, okay? Would there still be discrimination? Would there still be segregation of care? Well, single payer isn't an entire solution to that problem. We would have to think of other additional things that go on. But it's certainly a very important first step. Thank you. So let's just take um, just two more because we're slightly over time. So I just want to take them both at the same time. And then, of course, if you have other questions, please stay and let's discuss further. So, and ma'am, what was your question? Uh, my question is, uh, last year, I, when this was up in the, se uh, in the Senate, uh, the New York Health Act was being considered, people talked a little bit about the advantages to small business because um, the payments that businesses have to make for insurance are very great. Um, and uh, I wonder if this may be a little outside of the, you know, the medical realm, but I'm wondering if people are, do, have done studies about the overall economic effects of this and that they're considered to be advantages economically to New York State who, uh, that would be brought about by the Health Act and what they would be and how that works. And I, I realize I'm asking a, a very uh, complex question, but I just wonder if um, studies are being done or if there are people working on this. Okay. Yeah, we, <clears throat> we have a lot of interest in, uh, you know, if you have any uh, PhD economics uh, graduate students that want to do what I think is a really interesting study, uh, we'd love to help them get started. But yes, we believe that, number one, uh, small businesses, we now have over 300 of them that have endorsed the act because they see this as a way in which they can offer their employees uh, you know, health insurance, which they may not have been able to offer before. And we think that it will really benefit large employers as well. Because in fact, the cost, as we pointed out earlier, uh, now is somewhere between 11 and 12% of wages overall. And that would probably be reduced under the New York Health Act uh, to a lower amount. And let's just take one more. Gosh, go ahead. I just have a very brief question, and it's about one of your slides, about the, the situation of the bill in the New York State Senate. I saw that um, it required 32 senators to pass the bill, but in, in fine print it said 38 senators to bring it to the floor. And I wonder whether that's a bigger obstacle, ultimately, than um, finding one or two more senators to pass the bill. That, that, that gets into, yes, some very interesting uh, legislative politics. And uh, that was something that was, in fact, reflected to me uh, that it might take a little bit more than just the majority uh, to get to this, uh, you know, to get it actually onto the floor. Whether that's really, I, I probably should adjust that slide because I got it from a, a, a political analyst. I don't know the answer to that question. And it's very possible that it's not a, a fact. So I probably really, uh, should edit my slide. 
I just will leave it on the side um, because I'm not sure it's a real fact at this juncture. Great. Thank you. But that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Fine, again for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great questions, and that's a that's a, tradi a terrific transition question. So, if you uh, don't mind me saying something slightly political. That's why one of the reasons we're here. This is a complicated topic. There are obviously a lot of opinions about it. I can tell just from the questions. We have some people in the room who are familiar with the medical system. Others, like me, are trying to learn about it, trying to learn about this legislation. Um, but what we're doing here is we're having a dialogue and we're having a public discussion. And that's very important to do. And it's what NYSD 17 for Progress is about. And one of the things that I think we can agree on is that we want our elected officials to publicly discuss bills like this and to publicly explain how they're thinking about legislation um, and where they stand. Do they have questions? Do they, do they have concerns? What kind of information do they need before taking a position? Um, that's the only way a democracy can function, of course, is to understand how officials uh, come to their decisions. And if they don't agree with a bill, they can explain why, and then the public can decide whether or not they agree with the official. But, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to rope you into this. You're a man of science, so you need to, you need to cite uh, statistics, and I'm just speaking as, as a resident. But one thing that we do know is that uh, our state senator, um, Mr. Felder, has not taken a position on this legislation. He's been asked many times over the last year about how he considers it, and he says his standard response is, it's a complicated bill, uh, I want it to go through the committee process before I take a position. So what we're, what our, our organization is advocating for is, there are a lot of people in this district who we think this legislation could impact, and there are a lot of people in this district who care a lot about this legislation, and we want to know how Mr. Felder thinks about it, how he analyzes it, we have contacted him uh, about it to try to solicit um, his opinions. We sent a letter to him just a few weeks ago, signed by 26 organizations, asking him to begin a public dialogue surrounding the legislation. We haven't heard back, but we're gonna continue to go to him and, and ask him to dialogue with us publicly about this legislation, because that's the only way we can address questions and concerns and potentially move this bill forward. So with that, we just wanted to bring up two more folks to talk about things you can do if you care about this legislation, um, and if you want to help um, push it push it forward or push the, the, the discussion forward. Um, Morgan Moore and Ling Koshu, if you could come up. Go right ahead. Thank you, Dr. Fine, come on down. Uh, Morgan is um, uh, with the Healthcare Equity Action League in New York. You're the founder, right? Facilitator. More or less, facilitator. And uh, Ling uh, Koshu is a volunteer with the Campaign for New York Health. And so they're going to talk uh, briefly about what people who care about this legislation can do to continue pushing for it to move forward or pushing for a public discussion of the legislation to move forward. Hi, everybody. So um, the group that I'm with, Heal New York, uh, has been focusing mainly on advocating for the New York Health Act in Brooklyn um, and in, in Manhattan a little bit. Uh, and um, we've been doing things like po uh, holding postcard drives, doing canvassing businesses, um, collecting healthcare stories, flyering, organizing rallies, um, and helping organize uh, educational forums like this one. So uh, there's a we'll be passing out these pledge forms. There's a space at the bottom if you'd like to get involved um, with Heal New York. Please check that off there. Um, so, and this is Ling. Do you want to introduce what you do? Uh, I'm Ling. I mostly volunteer with the Campaign for New York Health. I also work with Dr. Ali and Physicians for a National Health Program. Um, and uh, my main focus with the New York Health Act is as a lead business coordinator, so getting business endorsements. So, we'll get into that soon. so we basically we strongly believe that New York can lead the way in passing a publicly funded um, health care system. And we're very excited to be working on this campaign. Um, but it's going to take a lot of participation and uh, effort from all of us. And so that's where you all come in. We've passed out these pledge forms. Um, and if you can please take a look through, we're going to sort of walk you through uh, some of the information on there so it's a little more clear. Um, but uh, and so it's the blue form. 
and uh, if you can check off anything that you think you might be interested in, there's no pressure. If you end up not being available to do it down the road, you know, we're not going to hunt you down. It's just, <laughs> just to sort of, um, you know, get involved wherever you might be able to. Um, so there's, there are three main ways that you can get involved. Uh, the first is sort of direct interaction with your elected officials. Uh, as John was saying, it's very important to try to push our state senators on this in particular because it's passed the assembly pretty much with no problem, um, but it keeps getting stuck, up, stuck in the state senate. So uh, the, the first thing that's not actually not on your pledge form, but the, probably the most effective thing you can do personally is to contact your state senator, if that's Cynthia Felder, if that's somebody else. Um, contact him and let him know, or her, know how you feel about uh, passing this bill. If you're in support, uh, they need to hear from you. They don't know what you're thinking in, your, in the privacy of your own home, so the only, the only sort of power you have is to interact with them as much as possible. So calling and visiting um, or lobbying them are the two most effective ways of sort of Getting, um, getting to them. They also, you can also email, you can tweet at them, you can uh, send faxes. A lot of them still accept faxes at their offices. Uh, so all of those are great ways, but um, calling and visiting are, are sort of the prime ways of, of getting their attention. Um, if you go to the Campaign for New York Health website, uh, under the Take Action tab, there's actually a dialer that will connect you directly to, to the phone. You don't have to look up their information. Um, you just plug in your address and it'll connect you to, to the correct senator. Uh, there's also, um, the, through that same tab, there's a way to tweet at them and to get their email address. So you don't have to hunt around at all. Just look at the Campaign for New York Health website um, to find that information. What is next? So uh, we have, are also passing out these Senate postcard petitions. Um, if you are interested in filling those out, these would go to your state senator. Uh, we'll be holding a lobby day, as Ali Fine was saying, on June 5th, um, and these postcards will be delivered to your senator on lobby day. It makes a great sort of visual representation of the support, the public support for this bill. So we're collecting as many of those as possible. Um, the lobby day will be taking place on June 5th. It'll be in Albany. There will be buses organized from Brooklyn. We would love to have all of you uh, come with us to Albany. It's a great day. We, we have a rally in the morning, generally, and then in the afternoon, we um, split up into small groups of uh, five to six people, five to seven people, um, and go and meet with either your assemblyman or your senator or someone in their staff and talk to them about the New York Health Act. So it's a really, um, it's a very sort of energizing way to, sort of to, get, to get involved with this. So please join us for that. Um, that is on your pledge form also. Um, we're also organizing constituent meetings uh, in Brooklyn. So if you want to go with a small group of people and speak with somebody, um, with your senator's staff in, in Brooklyn, that's also an option. Um, and this is the last thing I have is not on your pledge form, but I would say there are a lot of candidates that are running in, in Brooklyn. If you're interested in moving this forward, there are a lot of candidates that have made the New York Health Act part of their um, part of their platform, and they're really running strongly on this issue. So if you can do some research, there are, I think, at least five or six, not, there are two in Brooklyn that I'm aware of, and then there are some, you know, throughout New York State, uh, it's worth, you know, supporting them and seeing where they stand on other issues and, and see if, see if uh, we can get them voted into office and then you can maybe get to the 38. Oh, actually, I, I would like to address the 38, the number 38 that's needed uh, to move it. I believe that's to force it to the floor. Since the Senate is currently um, controlled by the, the Republicans, we would need 38 co-sponsors to force it to the floor. Otherwise, it has to go through the Senate Health Committee. And Cynthia Felder actually sits on the, the Senate Health Committee, so it's particularly helpful to lobby him and uh, try to convince him to support this bill because he does hold sort of extra power by being part of that committee. Since it's Republican controlled currently, um, it would need to move through that committee and then be brought to the floor by the chair of the, of the health committee. Um, so that's where the 32, the 32 would get us to majority support, the 38 would force it to the floor. So Lynn. Um, <laughs> So also, as Dr. Ali mentioned, we're doing a lot of education, information, uh, inoculation as a way of inoculation. So um, a few ways that we're doing that is we'd love you to host your own event, and we'd love to help you, the campaign, and lots of all the grassroots organizations. There's so many 
We'd love to help you organize one too. We can provide materials, we can provide templates to help run them and just make sure you're not forgetting anything when you're hosting an event. Um, people are also hosting house parties, so it can be anywhere from 10 people to 200 people at any kinds of these educational forums. Um, so and we have a lot of different speakers, a lot of different demographics and a lot of different styles, so we want to match a speaker to your demographic as well. Um, another thing that we're doing is at these events and also just on our own in your neighborhood, um, at other events, we are collecting healthcare stories and there's a video petition uh, platform that is called OnStack. You can go to onstack.com and check it out. We have about 100 stories on there now. There's 60 second stories that anyone can take just with your uh, mobile phone camera. Um, and we kind of go out and have conversations about people's access to healthcare, their healthcare experiences, you know, we have stories from freelancers, from business owners, from people who have gone bankrupt, to people who have seen people die in their families, to people who have just have been lucky that they finally went to see the doctor even though they feared, um, you know, all the costs and unexpected bills and found out that they were healthy or they found out that they were sick. Um, so actually Jane right here and Ellen over here will be collecting on-stack video stories if you um, could go see them and tell your healthcare story. Um, another way that we are collecting healthcare stories is with the Health Access Survey. A few of you have done it already in the beginning. Um, Ellen will also be collecting those surveys if you'd prefer not to be on video. That is a nice way for us to gather data and also be able to share your testimonials. Um, so other things that we're doing are gathering endorsements and that just means signing as an individual, signing a petition as an individual, signing a petition as a business owner, signing a petition as a doctor, as Dr. Ali mentioned, um, and also signing a petition as an organization. So all of those or endorsements are really important so that we can tell the media, so we can tell our elected officials, look, we have statewide, we have hundreds of thousands of people behind this, organizations, unions, businesses. Um, let's see. <coughs> Something in that same vein is um, issuing public memos of support. And for all of these things, we have we want to help you. We want to give you all the tools that we can, and we want to work with you to customize them for your organization, for your business, for however. Um, so memos of support from businesses and organizations especially is a great way for our elected officials to see that there is even more momentum behind this. Um, positive press also helps reach many people that we wouldn't otherwise be able to access. So we have a great letters to the editor team who again will work with you or provide you writing and templates to um, help get letters to the editors out. Um, and then even just talking, the power of talking to your own neighbors, to your own family, to your friends, that's really actually one of the most important because this is mostly a grassroots campaign. And so, um, you know, without the same financial backing and power that pharmaceutical companies and private insurance companies have. So this kind of word of mouth is vital. Um, and hearing about the bill from someone that you know uh, is one of the most effective ways to get on board. Um, some behind the scenes support for the campaign. Uh, raising money for the campaign is always appreciated. So if you're interested in hosting at your ho like house party for the New York Health Act, if we can incorporate fundraising into that, that's great. Um, and volunteering your time and skills. There's a wide variety of things that need to be done from data entry to graphic design to writing to design um, and translation also. There is also the People of Color um, and Immigrant Caucus for the New York Health Act. It's in the nascent stages, but it is a space for POC and immigrant um, folks to take more leadership on this. And so if if you're interested in that or know people who should be interested in that, please come see me. Okay. So the last couple things, um, at the bottom of the pledge form, you'll see there's a box so you can check off if you'd like to sign up with um, NYSD 17 for Progress uh, and join their efforts advocating for this issue and, and other issues within the district, please, please mark that off. And uh, if you'd like to get involved with Heal New York advocating for the New York Health Act, we We'll be doing all kinds of stuff through this legislative session until this bill passes, so we can use all the help we can get. Uh, we have one upcoming event um, that I'd like to invite you all to on Sunday, March 18th at the East Midwood Jewish Center uh, at 3 p.m. We'll be having a screening of the documentary short film, Now is the Time, and we'll have a, um, another speaker from PNHP, Martha Livingston, who is uh, 
professor and chair of the public health department at SUNY Old Westbury, um, and she's vice chair of the Physicians for National Health Program New York Metro chapter. Um, we have flyers over on the table here uh, available, and um, we also have the doctor, the 10,000 doctor sign-on petition if you'd like to take one to give to your, to your doctor, uh, and we have the business endorsement letters if you know a business that you would like to, um, to ask to endorse, or if you yourself are a small business owner, uh, we have those forms available at the table. So please come collect. We have lots of other flyers and information about the, um, about the New York Health Act. Uh, so I guess that's it. Do you all have any questions for us about how to get involved? We'll, no? be, over there. we'll be over there if you do. Um, and so please turn in your pledge forms. You can turn them in at our table or at the sign-in uh, table on your way out. And that's it. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Morgan. Appreciate it. I want to say I think it's uh, wonderful that so many people care so much about this bill. A lot of times we hear about national issues, and it's easy to wonder, how can I have an impact on national politics? Well, here is a national issue that we'll be hearing a lot more about over the next two years, but we can make it a local issue. It is a local issue. It's impacting our community and our community members, everybody in our community right now, and we can all play a part in moving the conversation forward. If you're a supporter of the legislation, there are ways that you can support it. If you have questions about it, if you want to continue that dialogue, um, NYSD 17 is eager to work with you um, and, and get our elected officials on the record and continue a public discussion of this legislation. Um, we just want to thank Dr. Fine again for coming. Um, uh, he did a great job. Our speakers, uh, Leah Koenig, Debbie Hurden, and there are a bunch of groups that helped uh, put this together, um, including the Campaign for New York Health, Physicians for National Health Program, Dittman Civic, Fight Back Bay Ridge, uh, Tour Trump's Hate, Rusha uh, LGBT, Love Trump's Hate, Sunset Park, South Brooklyn DSA, Brooklyn Resisters, National Women's Liberation New York Chapter, Fight Back Bay Ridge, On Stack, um, Hitterary, South Brooklyn Progressive Resistance, Occupy Kensington, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. There are a lot of people all over New York that are actively uh, involved in this and uh, so many other issues. So. Please get some more information and uh, ask any other questions you have. And thank you all so much for coming. It's great to see you here.